All right. Um, as I said, my name is Case Koster. I am a Java guy. I'm married. I have two kids. I live in Holland, in Delft. Um, I ride motorcycle, and I like big systems. And um, today I work on a big system in video, and um, you can hire me for all kinds of things as long as it involves big systems or big problems. So th this uh, time around in uh, the JDK, thank you for the invitations. I'm uh, here for three talks, one of which we're doing now, which is about object allocation. Um, another is about time management for developers, which will be tomorrow, and a third one about technical architecture of uh, bimodal architecture, which I hope you'll uh, all like. So hereby the invitation for all three talks, if you like. But let's talk about uh, object allocation in Java. I was at jQuery. Uh, Heinz Kibbutz has been mentioned already by the previous speaker, and uh, he organizes a conference called jQuery, which is very nice. And there were a lot of JVM guys there. And they talked about some of the things that the JVM is doing to make object allocation really fast. And I figured, we always talk about object deallocation, and I'll talk about deallocation a fair bit in this presentation as well. But why don't we talk about object allocation? Because actually that's the act that we as programmers still have control over, right? Deallocation is done by the garbage collector, but allocation is something we do. So let's understand what the JVM does to make object allocation really quick, right? If, if like me, you've programmed C at some point, or you know, I'm back at C using the Raspberry Pi, that, uh, that's not mine, but... Um, Memory in C, back when I was using it, was allocated from free lists. Uh, free lists are, uh, I have a picture here. <coughs> Essentially this, you've got a large chunk of memory and uh, you keep a, a list of lists. So you keep all the 1K blocks that are free in one list and another list for 2K, 3K, etc. So when you need a chunk of memory, say 15 bytes, you walk this list to find a proper sized block, and then you walk that list to find a free block, and then you pick up that block, which is too big, we split it, and then you put one thing back on the list, and then the object is yours to use, and you can start doing the initialization. Now this is a, an involved process, right? I mean, just by looking at the data structure, this is a lot of work. And this is what was, in, back in when I did C, was uh, the memory allocation algorithm that was being used. Um, it was bug-free, I'm quite sure, being GCC, but um, it wasn't fast, right? And in Java, it said memory allocation is fast, it's free, everybody says it, so let's look at why that is the case, all right? Ideally, ideally, and this is, you know, Nirvana, I'm not sure we're getting there, but ideally, this is the algorithm to allocate memory, right? I have a memory pointer, which points into a large chunk of free memory, and I need 15 bytes, so I move that pointer 15 bytes up, and those 15 bytes are mine, and I can go into initialization of the object. Right? That's the ideal world. No lists, no nothing. This is a, you know, a single instruction on a modern CPU. How can we get there? Right? How we can we go to the, from the free lists and the memory management to this? And yes, the JVM is pretty darn close to this. So let's look at memory allocation. You've got a large chunk of memory, which we'll call the heap, right? Uh, and you've got a pointer that points into the heap, and when you allocate memory, that pointer moves up, right? And that memory is yours, and then somebody else comes along, needs some memory, moves up, moves up, moves up, and at some point, the heap is full, right? Okay, so up until this point, we could just update the pointer, allocate memory really quickly, single instruction work. Now things get complicated, because some of the memory that we have previously allocated is now eligible for garbage collection, right? The heap is full, and there's parts of it that can be reused, and parts that can't. Well, if we're doing the naive implementation, what we can do is just garbage collect it, rearrange all the memory. That's nice about the Java memory model, right? It's all indirect, so I can rearrange the objects so that now all the allocated memory is one big chunk again, and the free memory is back to being one big chunk. And I can still allocate just by updating the pointer, right? Really, really quickly. But this comes at a price. 
it has a significant pause, especially when heaps grow. I mean, if you're using a, a 16 megabyte heap, you know, nobody will notice. It's not a pause, right? It's just something that happens. But if you're in a 64 gigabyte heap, it's different, right? You can't just rearrange 64 gigabytes and expect it to be millisecond work. So this is a very naive implementation, and there is one in the JVM, right? The JVM has a naive, uh, simple, compacting garbage collection that actually works like this. I think the, the applets back in the day would use this one, right? Which is fine for some purposes, but not for others. The other option is that, and ooh, let's see where we got this. The other option is to start keeping free lists in memory. Okay, bear with me. This is not what we wanted, yeah, but we're doing it. So what we can do is instead of reallocating all the memory, rearranging all the memory, we can start keeping free lists of the memory that we have, right? Which means we can't allocate using a single instruction, but we can efficiently reuse the memory. So this is a trade-off. This is a CPU cost, right? This is a cost CPU causes pauses. Uh, and this one gives you CPU optimization, uh, sorry, gives you memory optimization, but it costs more CPU to do an allocation. So that's a trade-off. All right, free lists, fine. I didn't want free lists, so how do we go from here? What if we do both, right? What if we don't allocate the memory initially from the old generation? Because that's a lot of bookkeeping, right? We'll do that later. Let's first define a smaller space that's easily garbage collected in a, in a single thread, you know, very simple compacting fashion, and we'll do the allocation there. Right? We'll call it Eden. And in Eden, what we do is we do single pointer update allocations, right? Which is what we wanted until it's full, and then we switch to using free lists where you can rearrange things, and then instead of doing individual object rearrangement, we rearrange the whole contents of Eden. Well, what we do is first garbage collect Eden, and probably find it's a lot smaller, so we have a lot less to do. I think you, you read a lot of uh, blog posts about performance, and many people say that if you can get objects to die young, they're essentially free, right? What does that mean? If I can get objects to die while they're still in Eden, right, which is one, two, three, depending on how you configure the, G the GC, a couple of GC cycles, they are garbage collected as part of a compaction that happens anyway. It's like the train. You know, if you take the car, you pay for your car and petrol, etc. but the train runs anyway. So if you get on the train, you know, that doesn't impact anyone's performance at all. It's running anyway. So if you can get an object allocated here, it's very cheap because we just the pointer update, and deallocation happens anyway. So it's essentially free. This is a generational garbage collection. And this was so successful that Sun thought at the time, hey, wait, why don't we do it again? Because you know these free lists are actually really expensive to work with. Ah, it's a lot of bookkeeping. Why don't we do the same thing that we did for Eden, but then put survivor spaces in between and do the trick again? And this is what most garbage collectors use today, right? Although with the advent of G1, that's changing. But up until now, this is the model that most garbage collectors were using, right? You would allocate an Eden. Once that's full, do a garbage collect, push it onto survivor space, and then once we get into the old generation, we do the expensive free list handled allocations, right? And deal allocation, which gives us a nice performance boost for things like small object. If you're parsing XML documents, for example, you generate lots and lots of nodes for the DOM, right? So make sure you don't keep track of them. Don't cache them. It's actually faster in some cases not to cache them because reallocating uh, an object may be cheaper than keeping it in the old generation and having to suffer through the memory allocation around that. Especially if you keep it for half a long time. If you keep something for a long time, it stays in the old generation, and that's fine. But if you keep it long enough to survive into the old generation and garbage collect it there, it costs, right? It costs another garbage collection cycle to process that memory. 
right? So either use it and let go as quick as you can, and then you're fine generating lots of garbage, or cache it, but then use it for a long time, hours, forever, you know, big caches, or not. Don't take it from me, measure all performance, right? But this is what I found. And then there's G1. Uh, I'm not uh, no expert on G1, so I'm not going to delve into it very deeply. I saw at least one other talk on G1, so uh, if you're interested, uh, that person can probably talk about G1 more. But what it does, it seg segments the memory into chunks, and it does the allocation inside that uh, those chunks. And from what I understand, this is all single pointer update allocation, so no free list inside the individual blocks. These can be one megabyte blocks, so they're really quick to garbage collect, and they're really quick to process. Okay, so you've got a lot of garbage collectors. How do you pick the one that's useful for your use case? How do you decide what memory allocation algorithm to use? And I've made, based on a few books that I read, uh, made a simple flowchart that'll tell you this. So first, you need to pick the right heap size for your application. Uh, and this is also where it usually goes wrong because many people don't actually know the right size for their application, right? Um, there are some ways to get around this. Uh, usually what I do, and this is a bit nasty, is just shrink the heap until the application crashes on an out-of-memory exception, and then you grow it back. And that's probably somewhere around the sweet spot, right? You can also calculate it. If you're doing a lot of document processing, for example, you can decide, okay, so the document is loaded into memory X times, times bytes, times some overhead, and it gives you a good ballpark figure of where your memory should be, right? So the first step is for you to learn, sit down and learn about your application, what is the right heap size, how much memory am I actually using? And it's surprising to find how few people actually gone through that exercise. Maybe you don't have to, right? Uh, memory is cheap these days, so. Maybe you do. If you have a very small heap, or you're running on a single CPU, right? I mean, my phone has, what, four cores now, so I don't think this is even true anywhere anymore. But if you're on a Raspberry Pi, small heap, small CPU, this might be a good garbage collector. It's a serial garbage collector, and it's a very naive implementation that I talked about earlier, right? When the heap is full, it just stops the world, and goes through its garbage collection, and then starts the world back up again. And you can use more fancy garbage collection algorithms. You can use G1 on a Raspberry Pi. But the question is, will it help? If I have a single core doing it anyway, doing a more complex garbage collection algorithm actually introduces overhead, which has the net effect of making things smaller. So while this one will cause significant pauses, the throughput is actually pretty decent for a single core machine. Right? So this may be a bit counterintuitive, but the serial garbage collector actually makes sense if you have a very small platform. Now if you're on a CPU bound, a batch processing thing, uh, I did a lot of document processing by, by one of, uh, at one of my previous customers, and you know, you've got three, four, five hundred megabyte documents going through your system, and this is all headless. And literally, there's no one waiting for the output. It's just about getting as many documents through the system as you can in as short a time as you can. So batch processing, you want something that's tuned for throughput. That you know, And it's fine to have a pause. It's OK to pause for three, four seconds as long as you get throughput. right? You get the deallocation done quickly, relatively. So you don't want the overhead of the other garbage collectors, which try to minimize the pause times. All the minimization, all those optimizations, cost CPU power, right? And they add to the overhead of the GC. And maybe you want that. So if you're using uh, um, an application that is interactive, like Eclipse, for example, you probably want something that has low, low pause times. And it's OK if it uses a bit more GPU. But if you're doing batch processing, you want something that just burns through the memory as fast as you can. You don't care about pause time. And then it's about heap size, right? If you're using a relatively small heap, and I don't even know if this is true anymore because this figure of four gigabytes, it was in one book that I read and then someone else, I talked to the JVM guys, they said six gigabytes. 
Essentially, if you're over a certain limit, 4-ish, 6-ish, you want to use G1 because it's more efficient. It has quite a bit of overhead, right? So it uses a lot of CPU, but probably if you're using this kind of heap sizes, you have a lot of cores and you probably also have CPU to spare. Right? So at that point, you want to switch to G1, otherwise you can use the CMS collector, which is probably the most used one uh, after G1 today. Any questions about it? I know when I come north of Holland, people don't ask questions during the presentation. So a bit about culture. In Holland, it's hard to finish a presentation without questions in between. So I expect them sort of now-ish. Right? So don't feel shy. Just interrupt me. Yes, sir. Um, I'm not a person who can talk about that. The JVM guys can. I know they're talking about rewriting some of the stuff that's in the JVM because the current Oracle JVM uh, is rather bloated with a lot of stuff in it that shouldn't be there. I'm sure it is, and uh, to be honest, I mean, if, if this is as low as four gigabytes and the overhead is hardly measurable, I would probably opt for G1 for other reasons anyway. So for, for me personally, it's G1 and less already, and I think many people in this room will, will have the same. I don't know about the JVM guys, I can't comment on their roadmap because I don't know, sorry. Uh, but it makes sense, and this is a much more modern um, garbage collector, completely different way of thinking about it, and I really, really like it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, as long as you allocate uh, uh, variables and stuff and go to the even space, it doesn't matter at all how many objects you allocate, or does yeah. it sometimes? So you, uh, you're, you're triggered by the fact that I say allocate, you know, get them while they're young. <laughs> uh, when objects die young, it's cheap. This is true for relatively small objects. I mean, if you, if you uh, fill up the Eden space quicker, that has some overhead with it, right? Um, so you, you probably want to tune that a bit. But generally speaking, what I see is people try to avoid object generation. Instead, they do caching. So they do short-term caching to offset uh, object generation. And in many cases where I actually started measuring performance, the cache performed worse than plain generation. On the other hand, if you just go out and just generate you know, millions and millions of objects, that is going to come at a cost. Or if you start generating lots of objects that are so large that the, heat, the Eden space is either too small or runs out really quickly, this will have an additional cost as well. So the uh, the point on you know trying to make objects die young is more about short-term caching or keeping things in local variables for a bigger scope than necessary to avoid object creation. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Uh, just to, to get, uh, give an idea, uh, um, which garbage collector are you guys using? Who's using G1 as a general rule? Okay, so it's not there yet. CMS, parallel, throughput, don't know. Okay, don't worry. Lots of people don't know, right? The, you, you guys know better than most groups, actually. Yeah, so um, if you don't do anything, the JVM is actually pretty clever at picking the right one, right? So don't feel like, oh, now I have to tune the garbage like It's actually better not to tune it at all. So if you see this long string of GC flags and nobody can explain why they're there, you're probably better off removing them and I think it'll improve performance, right? Somebody read someone's random advice on the internet and thinks this is the right way to configure a GC and it's not, right? Especially G1, let G1 do the work. It, it'll self-tweak much, much better than you can ever do, okay? so. My advice, don't choose tune GC unless you're, what, Kirk Pepperdine or Hans Kibbutz, right? And you know what you're doing. Everybody else, don't worry. It, it's fine. JVM will do it. All right. So I mentioned that I wanted to get to the point where we can 
allocate memory by updating a pointer. Now this pointer is a shared resource, right? And Java, almost by definition, has more than one thread. So we've got lots of threads updating a pointer. Um, obviously, we need some form of synchronization in this, right? Otherwise, there'll be a mess. I should have put that picture. You remember the picture of the dogs? There's the you see a line of bowls. I, I should put the picture, but I'll, I'll try to explain. There's a line of bowls with food, and then it says this is what synchronization should look like, and you see one dog eating at each bowl. And then you see this is what it's an, in actual fact. You see the line of bowls which have been moved around, and there's dogs all over the place eating from each other's bowls. So to avoid that situation, you want to synchronize on the pointer. But synchronization is not free either. So if you look at memory architecture, even on my phone or on, um, especially on server class uh, machines, there is the CPU, probably lots of them, right? The more the better. And they have local caches, and I'm, I've drawn one cache, but there's probably three, four levels of cache these days. And then there is main memory, right? Uh, and it's being said that main memory is the new tape. You don't leave the CPU for memory because it's just too expensive, right? These things run at insanely high clock cycles and there's just no way you can get the data from your main memory into your CPU fast enough. Going to main memory is a problem, it's hard and it's expensive. To give you an idea, and these are probably outdated already, to get to the cache and then you're on die, right? You're on there, on the CPU, and you need 15 clock cycles to read something from cache, right? Here's a, a, a link to a talk from Bi Brian, um, Brian Gutz. Basically, anything by Brian Gutz on YouTube, just watch it. All right, it's informative, it's helpful, and uh, he's a good speaker. So, 2009, he says, look, when you go to the cache in the CPU, that's 15 clock cycles. If you have to go to main memory, that's 200 clock cycles. Right, and by then you probably skip the cache and then never mind about cache invalidation. So anything where you have to leave the CPU, where you have to communicate across the bus with the other CPUs or with main memory is essentially a problem, right? It slows you down. So going back here, that pointer update, ideally that pointer update should be on the CPU, right? Because then it's 15 clock cycles, it's not 200. But by synchronizing, this one will blow away all kinds of caches and it'll send messages across the bus, there'll be memory barriers. This, this can cause CPU stalls, there's loads of stuff going on with this one single keyword that'll blow away your performance in high contention areas. So, especially memory allocation. So we don't want that. I don't want to synchronize on the memory pointer. How are we going to do that? It was simple, right? We start out with one slab of memory and you would allocate and you could use the memory, but no. We now have in Eden space, we have thread local allocation buffers. So each thread gets a little chunk of Eden, its own mini Eden, if you will, inside Eden to allocate its memory. And now each of these threads can use their own allocation space inside Eden. Woha. Um, a little bit, and this, this touches on the point that you're, you made earlier about Eden space. Um, I mentioned I was doing document processing. Uh, that's also the time when I made this presentation. And what we would do, um, I say we, but I didn't actually write the code, although you know I'm still responsible for it. Um, we would uh, get a, a document and it have to be transformed, right? We get a document, which is what? Word, PDF, PowerPoint, whatnot. You would load that and then you would get the text out and then you would XML sanitize the thing, or sorry, you would um, UTF-32 sanitize the thing. You would, what? Get, uh, you would have word list or skip list or... So what would happen is that you would load the document into memory, then we would get the text out, then from there, we would start sanitizing the text for UTF-32, uh, UTF-8, sorry, and then we would make word lists out of that. And as you can see, we loaded this, the same document into memory three, four, five times. 
This was because the utility classes we were using were very simple. They would give you, you would give them a file and they would give you a byte array back, which was the document. And then there would be an XML standardized thing, which give you, you would, would put one byte array in, you get a second one out. So I calculated at some point that for a specific piece of code, a document was loaded six times in memory, which for a 200 megabyte Word file, it's a bit of, bit of a problem, right? And then you would have copies. Uh, they could be deallocated immediately, but because these things were megabytes big, they wouldn't fit in Eden. They were allocated directly on the heap, right? They're called humongous allocations. So these things would be old generation from the get-go. And objects dying young only works if they're in Eden, right? So these guys could only be deallocated with full garbage collects. So we changed a lot, a lot of the code around, and for that specific component, we went to having not the entire document in memory at all, right? Because if you're taking a 200 uh, megabyte Word document, the actual text of it is very small. All of the Bible is less than a megabyte, right? In text, if you get a text file with the Bible. To give you an idea of how insane, in some respects, it is to have 200 word mega, a 200 megabyte Word file that is four pages, you know, for a school assignment. You would have a little buffer, the read buffer, and then we would have filters coded, and the result would be a little read buffer, and then the word list, minus the words you didn't care about. They were never even allocated. So, uh, allocated on the um, uh, old generation. So this is a huge memory saving, a massive memory saving only by using streaming-like APIs. Not saying the streaming API, but there's lots of ways to avoid reading. The old C style of doing things was, you know, you would read a byte from uh, a file, you would do something with it, and you would read the next byte. And to get used to that is a bit strange, but it makes a heap of, of sense, sorry for the pun, because this is how you have process memory most efficiently. Small chunks build up rather than break down and just use a little read buffer to read ahead to make sure that the OS can do its work quickly. Memory mapping can help, the fi uh, can help uh, reduce this so the initial file can be memory mapped and you can access it insanely quickly. And you don't need as many garbage collects. All right, so humongous allocations, what happens there is they don't fit into Eden, not in on the T-Labs, so they have to go into the old generation directly, right? And if you look at G1, humongous allocation is something that's bigger than a memory chunk. Well, you have the same thing. You need to clear three or four of these, but you have to imagine that if this one is clear, you, you, you can't allocate from it until this allocation is done. So it creates a lot of overhead and problems for the garbage collector to be in the process of a humongous allocation. So you better have a really good reason to do a humongous allocation. And often I find it's not, right? I'm, I'm not into image processing, so I don't know if that's stream processable, but documents and text is really, really better processed in series than it is as a block. But it takes the development team a step to go from, oh, I just read this file, then I do this with it, then I do that with, to, oh, wait, I need one, two, three, four letters, and that makes up a word, and then dot, dot, letters. And it's a different way of thinking about processing. But it saves a lot of time, because this is not a pointer update memory allocation. Yeah, this is an expensive one. OK, so now we've done Eden, and it's all without synchronization. Now when we go from Eden to the old generation, and I, this is a simplification, obviously we want the same thing. So if one piece of Eden needs to promote to the old generation, why don't we do sort of pre-allocation there as well? Why don't we make promotion local allocation buffers on the old generation so that even this one we can do without synchronization? Right? We don't have to worry unless our little bit of the old generation is, is uh, full. We don't have to worry about the memory allocation that other threads are doing. Another way of thinking about this, this is not how it's implemented, but essentially each thread 
has its own Eden and its own old generation. And that means you're autonomous. You can make decisions about memory allocation on CPU without worrying about the world around you, no matter how big it is and how many other threads and CPUs there are. Question? Sure. What about thread counts? What about thread counts? Yeah. There must be some kind of limit, I guess. Yeah, that, uh, um, thread counts in general, uh, you know, depends on the application. So I can't comment unless you know you, you would sketch. For for the purpose of memory allocation, uh, you don't want too many, right? Because you 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 the segmentation is not free. It 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 makes the Eden smaller, or it actually it grows Eden a little bit. There is a, a balance between how many threads this is efficient for. Yeah, so. Uh, very good point. Um, you would probably have to go look, but I think if if you think about your your own application, if you follow the natural model, you'll have you know Tomcat-ish. You'll have 200 threads that are essentially idle. Maybe they won't be all allocated. You'll you'll have maybe 15 threads, maybe four cores, maybe eight, right? And then you have two threads per core, which is fine-ish. Over over committing on this is not uh, helpful very much but it, it makes your code readable. So what, what is more in interesting to you? Is it the runtime performance or is it the readability of the code? It's hard to comment, right? Um, if you're looking for raw memory allocation, you probably want fewer, right? Yes, sir. So the, the T labs are these, right? In the in Eden, I don't know. I think they're equal in size. So what I think what happens is that uh, Eden is cut up in um, uh, equal spaces. But honestly, I don't know. I don't know what the re reallocation algorithm is. That's a good point. You've got Eden segregated into maybe four bits, and then there's a fifth thread. What do you give it? Right? That's a good point. Honestly, I don't know. It's a good point. Well, there, there's a source code on OpenJDK. <laughs> um, maybe you can make my next slide uh, on this. Thank you for the question. Very good question. I like it. Uh, I haven't thought about that. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. So. Um, this is essentially a test that you can use to uh, to see what it does, right? And this is a, if you look at what happens here, it makes a very a lot of uh, high. It produces a lot of garbage in a very short amount of time, right? This is the most insane way to test to add numbers. Um, so. Next is, I mentioned earlier that I like G1 for other reasons than for memory allocation. And one of the things that it can do, and I think at this point it's an experimental feature or maybe it's been enabled as default yet, uh, but you, it can do string deduplication. And uh, uh, maybe, uh, especially if you've done document processing, you've learned about string.intern, right? Who here uses string.intern? There's lots of nasty tricks, so maybe I shouldn't tell you. Um, so, if you allocate stuff that looks a lot the same, for example, you have the word foo or bar. I mean, if you look at the, the, the Dutch or English or Danish language, the number of words is actually pretty limited. It's in the thousands, right? Which for computing is, you know, negligible. It's small. It's a small number. So if you're processing, you know, student papers, for example, Chances are that if you would load the, in our case, uh, Dutch dictionary into the system, you would match 90% of the words, right? And you wouldn't have to allocate them ever because they're just Dutch words. You, you know the information flow coming at you is Dutch text. So there's going to be one or two Dutch words in there, I, I hope, right? Never mind the, uh, how do you say that, the texting speech that some of the kids now and I use. Um, so this obviously was recognized by the JVM guys, and um, very early you had string.intern. What you could do is you could take a string that you as a programmer know would be uh, used quite a bit, 
and you could say intern the string and it would go be something like this. I would have a string array, I would call intern on each of these and it would result in the strings being merged. So if they're the same, they would all point to the same instance. Strings are immutable for this reason in the JVM, right? So that this kind of trick can be played. There's a very nasty thing you can do and don't tell anyone I told you this, right? But uh, imagine you're doing a system where you need to lock, you, uh, for example, you have a messaging system. You have a server that's, that's doing messaging. Think open fire or wildfire, what it's called. When stuff comes in, you have sort of a user session that's bound to the user ID, which is a string, right? KJCoster at Nimbus.com, for example. Now, if I intern all the usernames, I have a reasonable expectation that if there is a situation, it's a piece of code that holds the username, all of that code, all of code that uses my username is pointing to the same instance. So what if I'll lock on this if I need a lock, right? Then I can lock inside my application on a per user basis. I have 15 connections, but I need to lock things for Kajan and I can do that on this string, that intern string. So that's a nasty trick that I ask you to forget that you can use with strings in Java is you take an identifier by interning it, you guarantee-ish that it's unique inside the JVM and then you can use that as a lock, right? And it fails as soon as you have a second JVM running the same application and then somebody thought, oh, I looked there and then expect the lock to transfer it to the other JVM. So what G1 can do is, while it's doing garbage collection, they figured, we're here anyway, rearranging objects. What if we find a string? Why don't we go and check the hash code against you know, the hash codes that we have? Why don't we deduplicate the strings while we're processing them anyway? Makes sense, right? I mean, G1 is an expensive garbage collector anyway. It, it eats CPO for breakfast. So, you know, we could just pile on a little board. It's not like anyone would notice. So what it did uh, was put string du du duplication in. And it beat. We, we did some performance tests for our stuff, and we were busy doing string.intern for everything that was coming in, you know, based on the assumption that stuff that was coming in was Dutch text. Therefore, the number of instances of words should be limited. And we found that we, could have m we should have splattered string.intern everywhere, because we actually got more performance when we started using G1 and we dropped our own interning. So we, go, we got a code advantage because we didn't have to intern stuff anymore and explain to new, new hires what interning is. We didn't have to worry where we forgot to intern and it was faster in, as a net result anyway. So good reason to switch to a G1 if you're using predictable data sets, right? With lots of strings. XML, I'm looking at you. All right, now memory allocation doesn't just happen in thin air, right? We've got an operating system and we've got a JVM running on top of it. So in closing of this presentation, I want to talk a bit about memory allocation and about memory over commit. So this is the, the world that we live in today. You've got a, a machine, right, like this one. It runs a JVM and it's allocated. Now, sometimes you want to run a JVM that's bigger than your machine, especially this, this is a rather old laptop. So sometimes I start stuff up and it, you know, it just doesn't fit in memory. And that's fine because I've got swap, right? I've got virtual memory on the machine. And that's fine, except that here memory allocation happens in nanoseconds. And here we already go to milliseconds, maybe more, right? Depending. But it's okay because this JVM, it may be big, but you don't touch that bit all that much, right? Nobody goes through all the memory all the time. There's always little dark pieces and the operating system is really good at identifying those and not mapping those, right? So your JVM is actually rearranged so that this is the unused bit and this is the much used bit. That's fine. You know, something, just something to keep in mind is that when your application runs slow, check that it's not bigger than your operating system memory. Now, if you run into swap really deeply, well, your performance essentially goes to shit because you have to go to disk to get your memory. And then suddenly that pointer increase that we were looking for without synchronization, remember, on CPU, on the cache, 
whoop, we hit a page fault, and then we go to disk to allocate 15 bytes of memory. That's not going to be fast. Okay, no matter how sliced and diced it, no matter if you use SSD, it doesn't matter. Slow. So it's okay to run into swap a little bit, right? Especially if your JVM is larger than it should be. It's not okay to run too deep into swap. And this goes another level as well. So here we've got virtual machines, right? Zen or VirtualBox or whatnot. And they have guests and hosts. And there's the host physical memory. And that again, you know, you can overcommit. You can put an extra guest on and you know and it runs into swap and that's fine. But you can't go and overcommit too much. And I've seen this, I've seen and then here you're in the guest and you do a, an insanely simple operation. I've seen two getters on an object. So, you know, get first name, get last name. And we were timing those, we had a, a time before and after. And it took, what, two seconds for two getters to execute, right? And it, not always, mostly it would be fast. Uh, it would be insanely fast. So it'd be either, you know, unmeasurably fast or two seconds. And we were staring at this, staring at this, until one of the sysadmins strolled in. And he was like, well, you guys are here. You know, you're lucky your JVM runs at all. So what we did, we got a machine like this. Problem solved. And this shows that you need to cooperate with your sysadmins. Imagine that. Talk to sysadmins. Ooh. Right? But they know, and they like overcommit because they know most JVMs, most guest machines are actually idle for most of their times. So if you're running a machine that's actually active, you need to tell them, look, overcommit is fine, but I'm actually using the CPU. Right, and uh, there's sort of this response time thing that I have to think about. So, give me something that isn't overcommitted too much. So, with this, I would like to close the presentation. Java allows you to allocate memory in a single instruction. Right, remember that. Thank you for your time. You. Any final questions? Yes, sir. Uh, a little bit. So, so memory mapping. I mentioned earlier during the presentation. Yes. What's your question? Well, I was just sort of what kind of situations? I mean, we have these two trigger get byte buffers. Are they else free, or are they they're expensive to allocate, or what? I uh, I don't know. It depends what you do with them. But uh, in in general, what, so I've I've done some experiments with memory mapping of files, right? So the idea here is that you can you can tell Java that it's not a byte array, it's actually a file, right? And then when you read the bytes from the byte array, it'll actually bring them in from disk. The <laughs> operating system will bring them in from disk. And this is actually uh, a way to read a large file faster. So we're doing uh, word and PDF processing. By memory mapping the PDF before you read it in, um, you incur some overhead because the, the act of memory mapping is relatively expensive. It can take 100, maybe 200 milliseconds. Uh, but then reading the file is actually quicker because there's one layer less cache that needs to be filled. So there's one copy operation that you don't have to do. So memory mapping of files for larger files, multi-megabyte files, can be, but by all means measure on your systems, can be more efficient because the less overhead, you're closer to the OS. That said, you know, your tools tell you, hey, this JVM is so big, uh, if you've got byte buffers, they're probably invisible to the tools. So you're using more memory and you may be running into swap when you think you don't, right? So you need to keep a really close eye on what your operating system says about your JVM when you're using byte buffers. Um, other than that, I have no experience with byte buffers other than accidental because you're using NIO libraries which happen to use them. But memory mapping for big files is really, really nice. But not for small files. Then it's really, really terrible. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much.